Okay, let's let's begin. Welcome everyone. I'm Gabriel Metcalf, CEO of the Committee for Sydney. And we are here today for our first public conversation with Mark Scott, the new Vice Chancellor of Sydney University. We're very excited to have Mark in the new role and to have all of you join us today to hear from him. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, for me, the Gadigal of the Eora, and let me pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. For those of you who have been members of the committee and following our work closely, you will know that the university sector has been a, a very significant focus for us. And the reason for that is quite simply that the universities are at the center of Sydney's efforts and Australia's efforts to build the future economy. Uh, we believe that the, the health of the university sector as a whole um, is absolutely one of the most essential factors that will determine um, how prosperous Sydney is, how prosperous Australia is in the long run. So we pay a lot of attention. Um, by some measures, by many measures, um, the, the universities have been one of uh, the country's great success stories. And to have so many top ranked universities here in Sydney is extraordinary. Um, but uh, by other measures, the sector has been hitting turbulence, not least because of the impact of COVID and the lockdowns on, uh, on international students. Um, and because at least in some quarters, a perception of, of um, conflict with, with certain parts of government. So it's not, it's not a simple story, it's a complicated story. So to sort that out, we're quite excited to have, have Mark Scott here. He is uniquely placed to, um, to reflect on the role of the universities and the opportunities um, before them, given his career. Mark began his role as vice chancellor of Sydney University in July of this year, having previously served as secretary of the New South Wales Department of Education. Um, and before that was managing director of the ABC, um, previously an illustrious career um, in, in journalism before that. So he's had a very um, interesting background to prepare him for this role. Um, the format today will be uh, a conversation. So I will start out posing some questions. You all should uh, feel free to submit questions via the Q&A app on Zoom, and I will do my best to get through them. So Mark, let me, um, let me start out by asking you to um, share first impressions, first impressions on the job. How does it compare with what you expected it to be like? How does it compare with previous roles you've had um, supervising a lot of smart people in the workforce? Well, Gabriel, thanks for the... Um invitation to have a conversation today. Really appreciate that. And I want to acknowledge some traditional owners on the land where I am today, the Camaragal people. Uh, if everything was normal, I'd be on the land of the Gadigal people uh, at the Sydney University campus, but I'm not. I'm at home and I've been here really for the eight weeks that I've been working as vice chancellor. So highly unusual time uh, to be starting in this role. But through the flood of Zoom, and I, I'm averaging, I suppose, about 10 Zoom meetings a day, you can cover quite a lot of ground and I've met a lot of people and I think what you get a sense of early on is the vastness of the endeavour that is the University of Sydney. It's interesting, if you look at that list of say top 50, top 60 universities in the world, none of the, that the University of Sydney is in, none of them are bigger than the University of Sydney and none of them have a more comprehensive range, a breadth of courses and offerings that, that are on offer at the University of Sydney. Um, what you get an immediate sense of is the extraordinary operational challenge of keeping teaching going and keeping research going at a time of massive COVID disruption. So a big uh, operational commitment to keep things going the way we uh, need them to keep going. But also the vastness of engagement of um, the team at the university on the COVID endeavour 
you know, the medical researchers, we have the public policy experts, we have the experts in vaccination um, and uh, experts in media and communication, all at work around trying to keep our community safe and trying to support our community in this vast effort we've got now. So you do get a sense of scale, you get a sense of complexity, uh, you get a sense, uh, and, and I think one of the really interesting things that I've had early on is a sense that the University of Sydney is 170 years old, but I get, um, when I talk to people, a sense of optimism that great days can lie ahead for the university. Certainly challenge now, certainly difficult operating environment, difficult political environment which we're operating in, but there is that sense, and people have said to me from other universities, that the University of Sydney is the sleeping giant of Australian higher education. I take that on board, I take that as a challenge, so does the leadership team, and I'm confident that we can take on the challenges that we face and get even stronger in the years ahead. Mark, the, um, the closure of the borders um, has affected um, many sectors of the economy, but probably none more so than the universities because of the inability to bring in international students. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, what that looks like for Sydney Uni, sort of where it is today and what you think the path forward is for, for that part of what you do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting, I think, to dig into the, the numbers a bit. One of the things that, that is very interesting when you, you get in and you study it is that, yes, Sydney, like many other universities, have had significant enrolments of international students over the past decade. And in part, that's because the, the subsidy to the university sector from the federal government has dramatically decreased over recent decades. When I was a student at the university, 90% of the operating costs of the university came from the federal government, today closer, than, closer to 30%. And, and that gap has been filled to a great degree by the income brought by international students. And that has been a subsidy for the facilities that domestic students have. And it's also really helped us meet the gap that exists in research funding, the cost of doing research and the way we're funded to that. So the money that international students have brought in has been put to great benefit for the Australian people. What's been interesting at, at Sydney is our international students have held pretty fast to us. We've had some strong enrolments again this year, and I think there are a few things behind that. One is it's a tribute to our teachers who've really worked very hard to make online learning engaging and compelling. I think it's a tribute to the, the Sydney brand in the region, particularly in China, but also elsewhere in Asia, that it's viewed as a world-class university and this is a credential, credential worth getting. And it also, I think, is a tribute to the tenacity and perseverance of those students who are, who are learning online every day. And now some of them have gone best part of two years without making it to campus. So a tribute to them. So Sydney has held on to more of those international students than I think any other university in the country. But the, the um, forward estimates, the pipeline, I think is seriously questionable. Many international students will come to university having studied year 11 and 12 in Australia. There are hardly any international students there now. That, that, that's a market that's been lost uh, through COVID and other pipelines are looking far emptier as well. So we won't have a bad year this year, but our estimates looking forward, I think are questionable. And what that will mean is less money for research and less money for the supporting infrastructure for domestic students. And actually will we'll, um, we'll mean that we might struggle to fill the gap between the cost of running domestic student courses and what we're funded for by the federal government's funding regime. So they're really an important part of this strategy. They're an important part of the business model as, it's, as it has emerged. And of course, they make an important cultural contribution to life on campus too. So, you know, it, interesting days ahead as far as international students are concerned. We all hope that those borders can open, can open quickly and we can welcome them all back quickly. Before, before, Delta variant took over before this latest lockdown. It looked like New South Wales was on the verge of, of at least pilot programs to bring international students yeah. back. I suppose that's that's not going to happen until after eighty percent vaccination. Is that well? Is it's that it, your it, understanding. It, it, well, it depends a bit. Uh, we have a model ready to go. It's a case of break the glass as soon as we get the nod. Um, I think there are some interesting questions uh, that have to be resolved as far as that's concerned. So, so simply, we've got a system. We can 
charter flights get students in. We have accommodation that is designated that will meet quarantine requirements. Um, these will be um, places, additional places, additional flights and quarantine facilities. So not taking space away from anyone else who wants to come into Australia. This is additional. But there are some questions. I think one of the in more interesting questions that I've been involved in thinking through a little bit in recent times is that many students from other parts of the world will have been vaccinated by with COVID vaccines that are approved in their countries, but may not be approved here. And so that's an issue that we need to resolve. But that's an issue that's, that needs to be resolved in any event. You could have a situation where borders open up and Australians want to travel internationally, but the vaccines that have been approved in Australia are not recognised in other countries. So there's a mutual recognition challenge yep. that impacts the student strategy. But even beyond that, uh, we are ready to run with a pilot and we are ready to um, open our doors to international students as soon as we can get them in. Um, do you believe that the experience of COVID is going to change the way higher education works in a permanent ongoing way? I mean, you hear a lot of people predicting a move to, to, the, to the MOOCs and the, the, the large online learning formats. What do you think is gonna be yeah. when you, when five years from now? What, what do you think we'll look back and say the results were? It's a really interesting um, argument. I remember when I was at the ABC, there was a law that I kind of liked about technological change, where it said the impact of most technological change is overestimated in the short run and underestimated in the long run. And it's interesting about MOOCs, that 10 years ago, people thought, oh, well, MOOCs are going to seriously threaten universities, and they really didn't in that first iteration. But I think post-COVID things will be different. One of the things that I think we can see and we're thinking through is that it's not that the in-person experience of learning will not be valuable and important. And there is something about learning together, listening together, understanding together, that is an important part of the university experience. So I am not one of those who thinks, oh, look, we'll all do it online now. We, we're going to Zoom forever. In fact, um, most of us who've been Zooming for the last eight weeks or 10 weeks, we can't wait to get back to the office, to get back in person. I think that's the way it will be uh, with universities too. The evidence we have is our students are desperate to get back. I think the more pressing question is, if students are going to be there in person and you are going to demand that they get to campus and turn up on time and engage in learning, how are you going to use that time in person? And I think there's an interesting parallel to what we saw in schooling and the rise of what's described as flip learning. It used to be that you'd learn the lesson in class and you'd go home and do the boring homework and boring exercises and homework was hardly ever compelling. Well, some great educators said, well, you could package the learning so that students, particularly using video and other tools, did the learning themselves at home in an engaged way and then came back to class to discuss it, to explore it, to identify the learning gaps, to make sure that everyone was up to speed. And I think if you think about undergraduate life now, they'll often be reading in advance of the class, the class itself, revision afterwards and assignments. And so what happens where and how you use that classroom experience to be really engaging and really compelling and really interactive, that's what I think the change is going to be. So we use the technology as part of the learning experience, but the in-person experience has to be something that can't be replicated by the technology. It's not just um, a, a video like you could watch on YouTube. It's going to have to be more interactive and more engaging. And I think students will demand that and I think our best teachers will want to be able to deliver that. Mark, um, understanding that universities have at least a couple of primary missions, um, one being to, to educate the students, the other to conduct research. How do you think about the right balance between these two missions? And, and I guess understanding that both of them at this point are subsidized by international students. Um, what are the right, what's the right funding model for each of these missions? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I have the answer to the right funding model, but I think it's a really important question to ask. The great universities in the world do not trade off teaching for research. They're great at both of them. And I think that should be the aspiration for the leading universities in the country. We should be great at research, not just in pockets, but across the university. And we should be great at teaching as well. And the student experience should be truly transformational, absolutely engaging. 
a great return of investment, not just for the money they pay, but the time they're giving us uh, when they are students. You, so you need to be able to do uh, both in a compelling and engaging way. I think there is a risk, frankly, if you look at the last 10 years of Australia, with the pressure that the business model has put on, that, that research has been the star of the show and the teaching and learning experience has been somewhat uh, second uh, order. And that's because if you're in the international student market, you want to be top rating, you want to rank well in those global league tables to attract the international students. And the way to really drive performance in those league tables is through research rather than through teaching. And, and even the, the um, federal government funding models, the research grant models, again, brings a big return to research. So I think somehow we've got to find a way where we are rewarding excellence in research, but also acknowledging the vital role that uh, teaching and learning has in the university experience, um, finding ways of acknowledging excellence uh, in teaching and making that um, a centrepiece of uh, the university experience. Now, precisely how you fund that and how you signal that, I'm not sure I immediately have the answers to it, but I think the sector neglects the teaching and learning side of that equation at its peril, that um, you really do want students who are going to university and their parents and families and their community of supporters to feel that they are getting the most wonderful experience from their time at university. Uh, and, and if they're not, then that's a real and fundamental challenge to the sector. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how the support for the universities here in Sydney and in New South Wales compares to um, Victoria and other states, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're across this yet, but um, any sense of, of how New South Wales stacks up and what it should be thinking about? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question and one that I'm continuing to explore. One interesting um, issue though, I think, and it's, a, it's something I've been saying around the University of Sydney. If you look at the University of Sydney, for, it's 170 years old. And for 150 of it, those 170 years, I think it would really have been acknowledged as the leading university in the country. Um, but few would say that now, and I think that's a title that rightfully is earned by the University of Melbourne. And if you look at the last, say, 25, 30 years, one of the interesting trends in the country is the rise of those Victorian universities, not just Melbourne, but Monash as well. And what you can see in Melbourne over, a, over several decades now is the universities working more closely together competing at times, but also collaborating and cooperating closely, working closely with the medical research centres there, the big new Parkville development and the key research centres that are there. And then the state government coming in behind the university sector and the research sector and putting significant dollars on the table to support that sector. And over time, the state government has put far more money into research infrastructure and support of that research capacity in Victoria than has been the case in New South Wales. And even this last week, you could see that the state government in Victoria has put um, significant additional dollars on the table to support the university sector there than has been evident here in New South Wales. In New South Wales, I think you've had a number of other elements at play. Firstly, Sydney and UNSW have not played together well. They have competed aggressively, but they have not cooperated well. And there's been a level of immaturity that has held back both institutions on the back of that. Similarly, not as close relationships with the research institutes. And as a consequence of that, or as a byproduct of that, state government far more hands off less involved, less financially supportive. And, and as someone who's come from the state government, I understand that if you have warring factions and tribes and, and you have money you want to give out and you're going to reward one but aggrieve the other, it sometimes might be a bit too hard. And you know, I've already had discussions with Ian Jacobs and Attila Bruns, who's going to be the new vice chancellor at UNSW. And we all agree we need to reset the relationship between Sydney and UNSW. We need to work more closely with each other. We need to work more closely with the research institutes. And we need to go to government with solutions uh, that we agree on that government can come in and support. And I think there's a good example at the moment. Um, different states are coming on, in on developments 
around uh, mRNA research capability. And you have a proposal before the state government that all the state's leading universities have agreed in, that we're all supporting and that we're all playing a role in. I think that makes it far easier for the state government to be able to come in and support. It's a similar story in Queensland, strong relationship between the University of Queensland and the Queensland state government, big investment in research infrastructure there. And, you know, I almost feel that those two states, Queensland and Victoria, because they haven't been New South Wales, because they don't have Sydney as a capital, have had to try harder and engage harder and make the investment. And I think they've reaped the benefit of that for several decades now. Wow, that's a very um, profound strategy idea for, for the sector here. And I guess you're suggesting it starts with the universities themselves cooperating better and that allows a different proposition to be brought to government? Yeah, I think you've got to find, you know, we're always going to compete. We're going to compete for students and we're going to compete for staff. And that's a reality. But there are a number, you know, you, there, it lead, leads a certain level of humil humility, frankly, to recognise that there'll be those other institutions that are stronger at things than you are. There'll be researchers elsewhere who bring capabilities that you don't bring. But together we can be stronger, right? I think the level of maturity comes into play that says there'll be a value add that comes through that cooperation and we'll both be better and stronger on the other side. And that's what you see in Melbourne. If, again, if you take a longitudinal track of the performance of universities over time, there I think there are two standouts really. And one is... The, the gap between Melbourne and the rest of the universities in the country. And the other one is the rise of Monash over time. And, 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 and so um, I think both Sydney and UNSW have a lot to benefit from working closely together. Some of the things that we're going to need in the future are big investments in research infrastructure, highly technical, highly specialised. Um, we won't both be able to afford all of it. So are we mature enough to make a single investment to be able to share that resource, to invite the government in and industry in and research institutes in as partners of that and together deliver a solution to which everyone, all the universities benefit and research institutes benefit, but the state benefits as well. I think it goes to capacity building of the city too. I think if Sydney really sees itself as one of the say, three capitals in the Asian Pacific, true global city, then a hallmark of that will be truly world-class universities and a true global capability of um, R&D, particularly in the medical and health area. That we are doing research here that is having global impact and attracting global attention. And I think the way for us to do that is to work together. And if you look at cities around the world, Boston is one example, Chicago is another, um, San Francisco would be another. These are all places where um, the private sector, research centres, universities all work together in a strong and collaborative way. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. All right, so that, that started out as a question about state government here. Let's talk about federal government. What do you need from the federal government in order to be successful at what you're trying to do? It's a, it's a very interesting question. Clearly, the dynamic between the university sector and the federal government hasn't been good, and I've been trying to explore, you know, reasons behind that. Um, and I'm not sure I have an, an easy answer to that. What I think we need to do more effectively, though, at the federal government is to truly explain what's happening at the universities, particularly in our research capability, and to deal ourselves in as partners to the really significant challenges that we face. And I, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to COVID-19, our researchers, our academic leaders are all over providing key solutions to the big issues that society faces. And so I think in a way, our engagement with Canberra really needs to be around us listening carefully to the problems that government and broader society faces, and then to work out how the university uh, is, is well equipped in order to deliver the support and help deliver the solutions that society needs. I think there are some pretty profound structural problems in the system that we face. You know, we are funding at the university uh, some years, $700 million or more in what we describe as a research gap 
the gap between the cost of doing research and the level to which we're funded. I'm astounded that some of the um, most demanding, popular, important courses that we do, including in, in medicine, um, the funding we get from the federal government does not cover the cost of running those courses. So I, I think the underfunding of R&D in universities is symptomatic of um, the broader underfunding of R&D that the federal government has to face up to, particularly compared to other OECD nations, and, and that's a problem. I think the other challenge that we've got in the sector is something that Minister Tudge referred to a little while ago. The shape of the Australian higher education sector is overwhelmingly formed um, as a legacy of the uh, reforms by Education Minister John Dawkins of three decades ago. And, it, and it, it means in global terms, there are a number of curiosities about the Australian system. Uh, one is the uniformity that you don't have liberal arts universities in Australia, you don't have the equivalent of an MIT, nearly all universities are comprehensive and offering a similar suite of courses. The other thing is that Australian universities are very big in global terms, and as I said earlier, Sydney is, is one of the biggest leading universities in the world. Uh, and also the research funding model means that every university in Australia has research ambitions and research focus and is putting significant resources into research, even though it's the top 20 universities that really dominate that research sector. And so, you know, I think there are some funding models that underestimate teaching and um, don't reflect the importance of teaching, that doesn't recognise the distinctiveness between different universities. And again, that's a conversation I think we need to be uh, having in Canberra substantively. All right, turning to a couple of questions that have come in. There's a lot of great ones. Um, what are your views about Sydney University's role as a city shaper? So this is asking beyond the boundaries of the campus itself, um, whether yeah. that's thinking about a precinct or, or other ways. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. One I've been uh, working on and thinking through a bit since I started at the university. And I was talking with our, our team in architecture and planning and design about this the, uh, the other night. Um, it's interesting, for, for a long period of time, for most of its history, Sydney, the University of Sydney's location was not an issue, you know, down the street from Central Station, adjacent to the city, wonderful kind of convenient location. And still, I think there are great assets in that. You know, I think the, our proximity to UTS and UNSW is a real advantage. There's a tech belt emerging really out the front door of Sydney from Central Station all the way down Harris Street. You know, got Atlassian at one end, Google at another. That tech central is gonna be a great um, uh, opportunity for the university to engage with the startup community and the tech, um, the, the tech industry. The fact that we have such a big public hospital, RPA, right on our back doorstep, gives us an opportunity to create a research and medical hub, unlike any other in the country on the back door of the, um, of the university. Again, tremendous opportunities. They're already developed and much more ahead. So it's great we are where we are, but there are other key things that we need to look at and consider. You know, I know through my work in the state government, you know, the three cities, uh, the coastal city is one thing, but, but of course the central city, round Parramatta, Westmead, Homebush, and then out in the southwest, the new Bradfield city as well. Um, the University of Sydney will um, already has and will build a significant presence at Westmead, closely associated with the hospital, but a broader university footprint in the heart of the city um, uh, out there. And we have significant land holdings and investments and opportunity in southwestern Sydney as well. In fact, that's been a hub for agriculture study uh, at the university for a long uh, period of time, and we think there are great opportunities there too. And so, you know, I think we're interested not just in where we are, but the industries that we can attract around us, the partnerships we can have, the employment opportunities in local communities. And so we've, we, we feel ourselves very much as part of an ecosystem. We can grow and stimulate an ecosystem, and we want to work closely with communities and community hubs in all areas where we're located. And we do want to be the premier university in Sydney, ir irrespective of where you live in Sydney, and opportunities to engage with us no matter where you are in Sydney. And I think our planning will give us great opportunities to do all that. 
Mark, what do you think, another interesting question here, what do you think is the potential of philanthropy to become a significant part of the funding model for Sydney Uni? Yeah, well, I want to pay tribute to um, Michael Spence and uh, Rosalind Ogilvy and the team uh, at Sydney. Michael is vice chancellor, led the single most successful philanthropic drive in uh, the history of any institution in this country. And the University of Sydney, through its Inspire campaign, raised a billion dollars. And that's money that we were able to put into infrastructure and capacity, into scholarships, into specialist program for our academics, uh, and also um, a, a fund that helps provide us with some financial security in the future. And the university will be looking to have another appeal to raise um, very significant money uh, in, in the time ahead. But, but you know, I think, um, I, I think it's wonderful to be able to tap into the generosity of our supporters and people who want to partner with us. And I think it's wonderful that Australia is catching up to other countries in the world by that attitude towards uh, philanthropy and you know, helping people as they deal with the challenges of um, intergenerational wealth transfer. I mean, that we are there with really meaningful things for people to do with the, uh, the money that they have earned in their, in their careers. Um, but it's interesting. I think you need to put that in, in, in perspective as well. You know, if we raised a billion dollars, that was over the best part of a decade. And if you have a billion dollars and you put it in the bank and you get tremendous interest rates now, that might pay out $50 million a year, you know in an organization that's spending $2.7 billion a year. So philanthropy at unprecedented levels brings some you know, annual operational recurrent funding if you choose to spend in that way. It allows you to do some special things that you haven't been able to do. We have a great new uh, building um, for public health and uh, for our medical and health uh, students. The Susan Wakell building, and it was the generosity of Isaac Wakell and his family that allowed us to fund uh, that building. But, um, you know, it's not going to replace, I, I think the bottom line is, it's not going to replace government funding. It's not going to replace international student income. It's not going to replace the funding that students bring in through their tuition fees and their funding arrangements. It, it allows us to do some wonderful things for our students and researchers. It allows us to have wonderful facilities, but it's going to be part of the funding mix, not a substitution, not a replacement for all those other elements as well. Um, a question about um, the humanities. Um, there's such a focus on um, universities as a path to get specific skills for specific jobs. But what about the what about the uh, what about the more general educating of people um, in a in a more traditional complete way? What's what's the relative balance between yeah. these ways of thinking about undergraduate education? Yeah, it's it's a really good question, and you're speaking, uh, Gabrielle, to a, a proud holder of an arts degree from the University of Sydney, and I'm a great believer in arts degrees, and I'm a great believer in the humanities. I I you know. People who say, well, arts degrees, they're not valued by employers. Well, they're not the employers that I'm talking to. The, 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 the kinds of capabilities that many employers are after, they want um, students, graduates with great communication skills. They want critical thinking, um, um, creative. Uh, they want critical thinking. They want collaboration skills. Um, they, want, um, they, they want fundamentally young people to be able to work in teams, to communicate, to think, collaborate, and resolve complexity. These are things that arts degrees develop in spades. And the kinds of creative opportunities that arts degrees develop, I think are developing the capabilities that are absolutely valued in the workplace. I think it's really interesting to think through what the future of work is going to be. You know, if, if all the analysts are right, uh, the nature of work will dramatically change in the decades ahead. Uh, new jobs will be created. Some current jobs that we have will disappear. Technology will take some jobs but create new opportunities and new jobs as well. And so what we really need to be doing at the university is creating lifelong learners, giving people enough knowledge and the skills that they need to be able to keep learning and dealing with complexity for the rest of their lives. So we, we're not training people for the first job. 
we're training people with the skills and knowledge and experiences that they will need so that they can master an array of jobs through a complex and fast changing uh, career. And so I, I sometimes think this, there's this kind of false dichotomy uh, here. Yeah, of course, you want someone to be ready for a job when they leave, but, but if the focus is just on the first job, we're going to dramatically undersell uh, what students are going to need to be able to survive and flourish in a complex and fast-changing world. And, um, you know, we are not going to give them the skills they need to learn and keep learning. And one of the things I've said around the university is that... Um, I think we should think of graduation not as a finishing post, but as simple a milestone. It's like you, you, this part of your learning, you graduated with your undergraduate degree, but you will keep learning for the rest of your career. And we hope that you keep learning in association with us at the University of Sydney. And we want to create a lot of opportunities for you to be able to come back and refresh and renew and, and sharpen up your career skills and insights uh, by continuing to learn with us here at the university. All right, a question that begins by um, acknowledging that like many large organizations, universities have not been particularly agile. So as you think about um, reforms, as you think about how teaching um, could work better in the future, maybe it's flipped learning, maybe it's, maybe it's other concepts, um, what will it take to actually be able to drive um, real change in, uh, in the way the, uni the university works and the way it teaches and the way it manages things? Yeah, I'm reflecting on that a lot. You know, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm interested in organizational psychology. You know, why are we uh, as we are? What is there in our history and our makeup that has made us as we are? And, and there are a few things, I think, that will be themes that I'll talk about a lot at the university, you know. We, we need to make sure that the absolute heroes of our work and the heroes of our focus are our researchers and our teachers, what's happening in our research facilities, what's happening in our classrooms, and that needs to be the focus of our effort. And I think we do need to make sure that we know the value of every dollar and that every dollar that we're making, we're directing towards the thing that makes us unique and distinctive. And so if we are a bit cumbersome and lumbering and bureaucratic and too much red tape, we need to declare war on those things and to liberate, um, uh, you know, liberate our teachers and our researchers to do what they, what they can do. And I've had good feedback on some of the frustrations of working in the system. Um, I do think we need to learn from each other in a far more collaborative way. I think the university is so big uh, with so many talented people. There'll be people within the university who are experimenting and trialing and doing new things, particularly around teaching and learning that we can all learn and all, all benefit from as long as we're not buried in our own bunker and in our own silo and not lifting our sights to what's happening elsewhere. What I want to create is really a community that is learning and sharing and is genuinely collaborative and respectful and trustworthy of uh, trusting of what is happening elsewhere uh, in the institution. So, you know, that we have open doors in our classrooms and we can learn from uh, best practice, that we are generous in picking up the great ideas of others, and that we are encouraging and rewarding those who are genuinely uh, innovative. I think it's one of the things I learned at the ABC. Um, it is hard to see a long way out what the breakthrough technology will be, what the breakthrough experience will be. Um, and so you need to have plenty of innovation happening and rolling. Uh, it's important not to pick winners too early. It's important not to second guess. It's important to keep um, trialling and testing enough um, that you can learn from those experiences. You've got to be not so risk averse that you're frightened of failing. You've got to be willing to fail fast um, and recognize that, that something you trial didn't work, but you need to keep pushing and, and um, leaning on. And, I, and I, I think there is a risk that a university like Sydney can be a little too risk averse and can be a little bit too uh, conservative. Um, and you want to create an environment where people can do their best work. And I think an interesting test that I've been mulling through is do the staff at the university, the researchers and teachers, do they feel that the university has their back 
and are great supporters for them to do their best work? Or do they feel that they're battling the university uh, and the university is hindering them and holding them back? Now, we've got to work in reality. We've got to work within budgets. We've got to work within rules and regulations. We all do. But do they find the university a great a supportive place where they can flourish and do their best work. That's what you'd want it to be. Yeah, wow, what a great, what a great test. Um, yeah, and your experience um, driving reform in large organizations um, makes, it's probably one reason why everybody perked up and took notice when you got this appointment. Yeah, I could see um, similarities, and certainly in, in the, my recruitment process, there was a lot of discussion about the experience at the ABC. And, and, and just as I said earlier about not picking winners too early, when I started at the ABC, if, if, I, if I'd done a precise five-year plan, uh, then I'd have missed some things in my first five years because what we didn't anticipate in my first five years was the iPhone, the iPad, social media, fast streaming broadband, these are all things that erupted in that five year period. But, but what I saw at the ABC is that if you were minded for reform, if you were on the um, lookout for opportunities, if you were moving broadly in the right direction, you, you were in a position to be opportunistic when opportunities came along. And so the ABC, because we'd been thinking about it, was the first really in Australia with catch up television with iView, um, we came to a leadership position in social media and over time the ABC has come to a leadership position in online news in the country. And most significantly for me, the ABC got a reputation for being innovative. The ABC, I think, was viewed as the most conservative and somewhat dull media organisation. Um, uh, very, very conservative in the way it approached things. Well, I think over time, particularly by the way the ABC embraced digital, it was seen to be a bit of a pioneer and an innovator in a way that it had not been viewed before. Um, and again, I think you just wanted to create an environment there where people could do their best work. And I, you know, I think what I bring a bit is this sense of optimism and belief in organisations that if we work together in a genuine collaborative way, we can take advantage of opportunities that come before us strengthen the organisation and strengthen the capacity of people to do their great work. And there are similarities between the ABC and the university. They both are big institutions. They are public facing. They generate a lot of attention and a lot of uh, critique and a lot of strong opinions. But most importantly, they're both populated by highly intelligent, highly creative people who are passionate about their work People who in the main are pretty uh, sceptical of management and uh, business types uh, and who don't perhaps want to be told what to do. But fundamentally, if you can create an environment that supports them to do great work, they will do great work. And, and you asked me at the beginning what I've, um, what I've seen at the beginning. I think one of the things I've seen is that people are passionate about their work at the university. They're passionate about their research. They're passionate about their teaching and their engagement with students. They know this is important stuff. And they, they did it because they wanted to make a difference. And they still want to make a difference today. They still believe in the importance of that work. And that intrinsic motivator drives and focuses them every day, despite all the frustration and, and all the grievance that people can have from time to time. The work matters very much to the people at the University of Sydney. Um, let me bundle together a few questions about international students. Um, what, uh, how likely is it that China might restrict the numbers of students who can uh, come to Australia? How likely is it that universities in the UK or US or Canada um, gain market share at Australia's expense because they've been able to open sooner yeah. How confident are you that the numbers will get back up to pre-COVID levels? Yeah, they're really good questions. Let me take them a little bit out of order. Uh, I think one of the reasons our, our numbers held well and we had you know, students coming in and starting with us at the beginning of the year was in part at Sydney because Victoria was in shutdown for a lot of the second half of last year, of course, but also North America and Europe had, were in the midst of uh, the COVID calamity. So there could be an argument that said Sydney was a bit of a safe haven, and it also sends a signal that where there is COVID disruption, 
a market might move elsewhere. Um, and I had a report of a university in Scotland that had had a 40% increase in international students as they began their new academic year in the last month. So, um, and we also know that Northern Hemisphere universities have been aggressively recruiting and recruiting our students um, and offering uh, full um, credit for the work that they had completed with us um, on their way to completing a Northern Hemisphere degree. So there's a risk there. But we'll know next year, we don't have immediate signs. International students um, enroll fairly late. We don't yet have visibility into 2022, but it will be, we'll be moving into the third year of disruption. So it does represent vulnerability. As to China, whether China would make a step to um, shut out our universities, it's interesting. They've clearly made punitive steps against a number of other sectors where they have felt that they have been able to fill that sectoral gap by markets elsewhere than Australia. I think it's interesting they haven't done it up until now. There's no doubt that the Chinese have depended on international education to provide an education to their uh, aspiring middle class and those who will have leadership roles in the community. And time I've spent in China, I've always been astonished at how many of the leaders I have met have had international educational experience. So I think we can be confident that there will at least be some market that wants to come to us. And I think that market will find its way to the older, more established and higher ranking institutions in the country. So it may not be the same for every university, but I think if you're in Queensland, Sydney, Melbourne, the G08 universities, that market will still find itself, um, will still find itself there. But it's a little hard, it's a little hard to say at this point, but but We've seen no signs of students in a sense being warned off our university. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, let me bundle together a couple of questions about research. Um, you, you already spoke to the, the funding gap um, that requires all, all the research you do to be cross-subsidized by international students. Um, a lot of the conversation about what needs to change with research um, is about, um, seems to be about wanting to see more, um, more visible impact on the economy, more commercialization, which of course leaves out things like basic research. And, mm. and you know, clearly a lot of university research is not going to be directed toward, toward commercialization, but how much should it be? Does the model of how the problems are framed need to change? Does the, does the system for deciding what to fund need to change or is it just about increasing the dollar amount? Yeah, I, they're all they're all really good questions. I think um, I, I was interested. Uh, Eddie Holmes is our researcher who helped map the uh, COVID nineteen genome, and he was the one who pressed the button to have it put up online, which then allowed all the vaccine researchers and manufacturers to commence their work to create the vaccine. And and so Eddie's famous for posting the data on the virus, but as he points out. There's 30 years in the lab before you press the button. And I think of all the you know, great research that people talk about that practical and transform lives, we've got to realize that there is years of work in that broader basic research and, and um, coming to understand how things are that are precursors to translating that research into applications that fundamentally change our lives. And you need to be able to do both and your research infrastructure needs to be able to fund both. And I think it's really interesting to me. I mean, uh, as I've had it explained to me, even universities that you think should be making a bomb out of the um, research that fundamentally came to life in their labs, universities like Stanford at the heart of Silicon Valley, really a, a very small proportion of um, Stanford's income comes from royalties from um, inventions made on its campus. I mean, it's made a lot more money, as I understand it, from people who made their billions giving money, some money back to Stanford in philanthropy than it has just, you know, during... Yes during operational license fees. So it's important, we need to be skilled at it. We need to be good at partnering. I think one of the questions we have at the university is we need to hold on to our investments in some of these things rather than, than, than losing our stake and in our interest early on. But again, I think it's a bit like the philanthropy question. I think 
the, the modeling does not suggest that this fundamentally changes the business case of university. You know, if, if um, we didn't, um, if we were better at, at translating our research into, into practicality, we wouldn't need international students. That's just not the story that the dollars tell. We need to be better at it. We need to be well skilled at it, but fundamentally, um, we, you need a whole R&D infrastructure. And I, there is a risk, as, as you kind of point out in your question, that if you are simply rewarding the last mile and are under-investing then everything that got, went to get you that point, you might have a good couple of years, but in a decade from now, there's going to be a lot less to translate and a lot less to commercialise because it's the basic research now that is uncovering the knowledge that will underpin the great translation and commercialization effects of, of uh, 2031 and 2041. And so it can be really short-term thinking to just think you can, um, you know, fatten that pig on market day and just think that will be all right. You've got to actually uh, be making the investment all the way along the research value line. And part of that is investing in the careers of early career researchers and giving them continuity and access to grants early in their careers and to allowing their careers to develop and be supported all the way through till finally when you're getting some very big and very substantive payoffs at the end. Yeah, so it, it's a, there's a, there's a, an observation made a lot that that Australia does not commercialize its innovation um, in proportion to the amount of innovation that happens. Um, but it sounds like you're saying that might not be something that needs to happen inside the universities. That might be that might be a change to the commercialization well, system. I, I, think, I think it's I think it's probably all of it. I think um, I think we need to be better at working with industry and partnering. And and I've been really struck at some of the big partnerships we have on campus at the moment with with global firms like. Um, Microsoft and General Electric and Talos and others, big investments uh, with us. So are you good at partnering? Um, do you have the capability of, of working with venture capital firms and the like to bring in additional funding when you have good uh, opportunities at play? And do you have a supportive and trusting environment with your um, key researchers around that? So you need to be doing all of those things. And I think the CSIRO clearly have an important role here too. Um, but I'm saying if that's the only part of your focus, you're going to miss um, the whole pipeline effect that gets you to that point. Um, and I think venture capital is not a bad model. You've actually got to be placing a lot of bets upstream for the fewer bets downstream that really pay off significantly. And part of the genius of great venture capital people is knowing where to place those bets way upstream to get the few that pay off downstream. You can't just focus on the downstream uh, investment. And that's the way we need to think about the breadth of research infrastructure and research thinking in the country. But fundamentally, it's not just getting that process right, it's just getting the level of investment right at the first end. And I think, again, you go to OECD comparators of what government is spending through universities in R&D and what industry is spending in R&D and Australia is not at the end of that list that you want to be at. We're at the tail end of that list rather than the top end of that list. And, um, you know, I, I think the future of this country, really, medium term, longer term, is not going to be, you know, what we dig up out of the ground. It's going to be the people who walk the land and their ideas and their ingenuity and our, our um mental horsepower, and that's where R&D investment is going to be so vital. All right, Mark, we just have a couple of minutes. Maybe I'll give you the chance for some closing thoughts. Um, what does the task ahead look like? What does success look like for you? Well, look, I am uh, delighted to have the opportunity to work with the community at Sydney. And, you know, I think one of the things I really want is the city to feel it's their university. It's a true world-class university and things are happening at that university that don't just benefit the researchers who work there and the students lucky, lucky enough to study there, but we all benefit from the great work that's taking place through the research and the teaching that takes place uh, at the University of Sydney. So I want that sense of ownership and I want that sense of um, connection 
between the work that's happening at the university and the broader community that's uh, that's wrapped around it. You know, I, I someone said it a little while back, I, I like it. I, I think we want the University of Sydney to be an elite university, truly world-class, high performance, high standards, global impact. But you want it to be an elite university, but you don't want it to be an elitist university. And one of the things I'm really keen to do is to open the doors of the university, particularly for young people with potential and talent, no matter what school they went to, no matter what environment that they are coming from, that if they can flourish at the University of Sydney, you want to create a place for them at the University of Sydney, you want to support them in order to do that. So, you know, I, I want us to, fill, uh, to fulfil our potential to be Australia's finest university, to be one of the finest universities in the world, and a university of which this city is rightly proud. Mark, thank you. Thank you for um, taking on this role, first of all. Thank you for sparing a few minutes to talk with us um, early in your tenure. Um, yeah, I think, I think I can say all of Sydney is rooting for you. Thanks, Gabrielle, and thanks everyone for uh, being part of the conversation today. Okay, everyone. Um, we'll see you at the next one. Have a good day.